Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with PyTorch at Washington University. In this video, we're going to start to actually use PyTorch. We're going to see how to first do direct linear algebra calculations on it that have nothing to do with neural networks, and then jump right into neural networks. So why PyTorch? It's supported by Meta, aka Facebook, aka the first letter in FANG. Works well on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Excellent GPU support, as well as Mac M1, M2. And it works in Python. Torch originally was in Lua, and I have never touched that language. And that was apparently a, a blocker to it a bit, so now that it supports Python, we're, here we are. There are other tools like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, Jax, uh, other languages as well. First, we're going to use PyTorch directly. It can be used as a linear algebra library. You don't have to do anything to do with neural networks. So I want to do some more examples of that. I did one video where I showed how to calculate the Mandelbrot and zoom into it, and we're going to see a baby version of that here. The first thing you want to do is this. Find out what type of device you're on. You'll see this code near the top of every single one of the PyTorch classes that we're going through. I'm checking to see, are we using GPU? Are we using a Mac M1 or M2? There's other things to do. There's AMD. There are Tensor or TPUs from Google. I'll talk about more advanced processing units later in the course, but primarily we are focusing on GPUs, NVIDIA styled CUDA, or Mac M1, M2 or the CPU, if, if you absolutely must. It's going to be slow, though. Use Colab, though. Colab gives you a free GPU to make use of. So this is what the code looks like. When we create the tensors, that's when we're passing in the device. And that defines that that particular calculation is going to happen on, say, the GPU or on the CPU. We can construct any real structure here. Here we have a it's essentially a matrix because we have two of these, these values, but it's, it's a one row matrix with three and three. And then this is a column matrix over here with two and two. Then we're going to matrix multiply these two and you can see the result that we got. We got a 12 and you'll notice too, there's two brackets. So that is a matrix. It's a matrix of just one number of 12, which is essentially a scalar, but it is out on the first CUDA device. We'll see how to get that back into a usable number in a moment. Here we're creating two tensors, one and two, three and three. Both are going to be on whatever device we detected earlier. We're going to subtract the two, print out the subtraction, and then we're going to do this. We're going to convert it to CPU, so we're going to bring it back, and then we're going to convert that to, to NumPy. And we print that out, and it's negative two, negative one. And you can change these values so you can reassign them and that'll reassign them out on the GPU, CPU, the Apple Silicon, wherever you have put that. And then we subtract and then we convert it back into NumPy so that we can make use of this. Now let's do the Mandelbrot example. So Mandelbrot, there's plenty of videos that go really, really deep into what a Mandelbrot is. And I'll probably do a short myself where I just give you the bare minimum of what to know about a Mandelbrot. Let me give you the even shorter description here. This is a Mandelbrot plot. You can zoom deeper and deeper into any part of this and it's, it's like infinitely complex you would eventually reach a point that you could not magnify beyond because you'd blow out your 64-bit floating points. But if you can create higher order, like 128-bit, whatever, 256-bit, then you could, I mean, this thing would just keep on going from, from what I've, I've been told. It is a two-dimensional plane, and we use complex numbers because complex numbers have a real part, an imaginary part. One of the axes is the real, the other is the complex. It's a common use of complex numbers. Complex numbers come from the fact that if you take the square root of a negative one, now you're in trouble because anything squared is going to be positive. So you need the imaginary number, i, which is your imaginary number, equals the square root of negative one. Here we're just using it as a coordinate plane. And you use a very simple function that's recursive. You keep calling it over and over again. As you call that recursive function, the output is going to either get bigger, 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 and shoot off to infinity, 
or it's going to orbit and then maybe shoot off to infinity or orbit forever. How many times it goes around before it shoots off to infinity is what determines the color. And you just loop through and you do every single pixel that you have here. Again, density property of the numbers, I, the, the whole area zoomed out here is not that, not that big. I think it's less than 10 in each direction offhand. And as you zoom in, you're getting more and more and more precise floating point numbers as you go deeper and deeper and deeper. I'm not gonna talk too much about the render function. This is just how you're taking that scale of how many orbits it successfully had. We're using trig functions so that we have a nice gradiated range of those colors as we go through, and then we render the whole thing to an image. The Mandelbrot helper, the function that we have here, this is going to do how many cycles? The more cycles you have, the more accurate of a Mandelbrot you have because the cycles de determines your color range. You are orbiting, like I said, that is how many numbers you go through to see how far it's going to orbit. If you just say 100, then it's going to try 100 steps in that orbit. And if it broke orbit at 200, we'll just never know about it. So you can get pretty realistic looking Mandelbrots without a tremendous number of cycles, but the more cycles you have, the more accurate it's really going to look. And this also shows some of the important differences between a GPU and a CPU. The GPU is massive parallelization, so we're calculating every pixel at once. So if you specify 100 cycles, it's going to calculate all elements of that 100 times, irregardless if they've already shot off to infinity or not. If it shoots off into infinity in stage three, it's it's gonna still keep calculating because that's what GPUs do. If you put this on a CPU, you'd probably stop because each of these is being handled independently. Here is essentially the, the Mandelbrot equate the core Mandelbrot equation. We keep adding to it and we loop through all the cycles. That's the semi-recursive nature of this and we add to the counts, keeping track whether we've diverged or not. And we consider it to have flown off to infinity if it gets greater than a, than a four. This is where we calculate it. We are being passed in the render size. So is it a 4K image? What, what is it? We want to center it at some coordinate on here. And then we want to specify what zoom factor we are. How, how deeply are we going into there? And it returns how big the orbit was on each of those values in the image. And we just render it as that picture. So this is making use of the linear algebra features of PyTorch without even doing anything neural network. And you can see that the code all looks very NumPy-like. So that's that. Now let's look at a regression neural network. We're going to do the miles per gallon data set. This is a data set that you will download from here. It shows you a bunch of cars. Here you can see we're trying to predict the miles per gallon using these other values. We're not gonna really use the name of the car, but we're just using the numeric values here and we're gonna to try to predict the miles per gallon. First, we're gonna define the neural network. PyTorch is very object-oriented, so you're going to create a network descended from neural network module, and we're gonna create all of our fully connected layers, fully connected one, two, and three. The first layer is linear. It has input neurons, and it's going to go to 50 hidden neurons, and then to a second hidden layer, which has 25. These numbers have to always line up. The 50 output neurons that you have here must go to the 50 input neurons in the next layer, then 25 and 25. You'll get an error if these numbers don't align. Then forward, is what is called automatically. That's the forward pass as it's calculating the output of the neural network. You have some X that comes in. You call your first fully connected layer and you run it through the rectified linear unit activation function because that's the activation function we're using. And then whatever that output is, you run through the second fully connected layer. And then finally, you put that through the third layer. Since it's regression, there is no activation function on the output layer. We're simply passing that on 
to you. You could define a backward as well. However, it's usually best just to have PyTorch infer that using its automatic differentiation. You'll notice that PyTorch is very hands-on with this. You are calling the activation functions directly. You're creating all the layers directly. You're not letting it link them up. You're writing code to link them together. This is a difference between PyTorch and other libraries like Cura's, and this is why PyTorch has become so popular for research because you really have control of the nitty gritty and you are also fully responsible for the nitty gritty. It's a double-edged sword. So we're gonna read that data set. We're gonna extract the names of the cars. We are gonna handle some missing values and this is using pandas like we saw before. You're going to fill the, not a, the NA values with horsepower of uh, the horsepower's median. We like to fill in the median value for missing values because that way if there's extreme outliers, it's not going to be affected. We take all of the numeric values that we're predicting on, we call values, which gets the numpy values, and then we're going to place that into the miles per gallon value. So we're, we're replacing it with all the hidden values filled in. Then we convert the X and the Y into tensors on the appropriate device and as 32-bit floating. The X are the inputs and the Y is the expected output. Now we instantiate the neural network. We're passing in the shape directly rather than just hard coding the number of values here. That way if we add in another value or remove one, it's going to adjust automatically. We are hard coding the one value. That's the output neuron, the single output neuron. You do want to tell it that your neural network is going to be on the appropriate device so that it's off on CUDA, the GPU, wherever it needs to be. We're going to use the mean square error loss. We'll deal more with the various loss functions soon in the module where we learn about backpropagation. But MSE loss, it, it's just basically taking the difference between the expected and the actual output from the neural network and squaring it and summing them. We're going to use the atom optimizer to optimize the weights of the neural network with a learning rate of one. This is a very common optimizer to use. We'll see more about Adam when we get into backpropagation. Now we're gonna loop over 1,000 epochs. In each epoch, and this is where PyTorch really makes you aware of what's going on here. We're gonna zero the gradients. So every element in the training set, you're going to get a new set of, of gradients. Normally you just accumulate them in every single element of the batch. So you're taking them in batches, maybe 32 rows from the training set as a batch. When you hit the end of the batch, then you are going to actually update the, the weights of the, of the neural network. So we're here, we're not using batches. We'll get into that later. We're simply sending the entire training set through in each epoch. We are calculating the output from the neural network and we're flattening it so that it's just a single number. We're calculating from that loss function, the mean square error, so the output of the neural network versus the Y. And then we calculate the gradients. We zeroed them here. Here we're gonna calculate them. If we hadn't have zeroed them, it would just keep adding to them. And that's fine within a batch, but not at the end of the epoch, you're supposed to zero them. Otherwise it'll fail miserably because you're still punishing it for errors in the past if you're not zeroing those. And then we take the optimizer through a step that actually updates the weights based on that backward step. And we go through this a thousand times and you can see that the error gradually drops. Now we're just, we're just using a thousand epochs and we're gonna get a lot more sophisticated with that. This is the more conventional way that you usually see this done in PyTorch. Hyperparameters are like how many hidden neurons we have in each one. Generally, you have to experiment with that a bit to find out the optimal structure for the neural network. We'll also see some automatic ways using Gaussian process to determine what, what the optimal values might be there. Then when you try to predict it, you're gonna call model with some X values and you'll see there's the predictions for the miles per gallon. Those look about the range that you would expect. We're gonna calculate the root mean square error on it. Root mean square is just the square root of RMSE. But the advantage to root mean square error is it takes the error and puts it back in the same units as what the training data was. So the root mean square error of 3.48 means that you're around three and a half miles per gallon wrong 
Whereas if you look at up here with the mean square errors, you don't, you need to take the square root of that to really know what that means in terms of plus or minus how many miles per gallon you actually are. But it's a waste of time to calculate the square root on every single one of these because that's just another function that that it has to calculate and we don't care. We just care that it's going down. Then we do some others where we basically get the car name and we print out the, the predicted miles per gallon. Classification is very similar. For this, we're going to use the iris data set. Iris data set, we saw a little bit of that before. It's four measures for three different classes of iris flower. And here you can see that we are setting up very similar. We have the input count, but we now also have an output count. We have the input count here and the output count here. And just like before, this 50 has to line up that 50, that 25 to that 25. Otherwise, you're going to get an error. We're calculating the ReLU on each of those fully connected layers, but at the at the end, we're passing it through softmax, which we talked about before. Softmax ensures that they all sum to one. And then we are going to open up the iris data set. This is where I have it on my website. Here you can see the four inputs used to produce, predict the type of iris flower that it actually is. So we're gonna use a label encoder to change those individual flower values like setosa, vertex, color, the different types of iris, convert that into zero, one, two. And we're going to then get the, the X, which is going to be those four values. Those are what we're predicting on. And then the Y, we're going to label encode it. So one type of the iris flower is all going to be zero, the next one, and two, and so on. That's the way that you typically, in PyTorch anyway, encode the output for a classification. It's a categorical value, so you label encode it. Now with PyTorch also, if it's on the X side, if it's on the input, then you'll convert it to dummy variables. So be aware of that. We convert X and Y just like before, just like before we instantiate the object. Now we're gonna use cross entropy because we've got multiple values there for the classification. We create Adam just like before. We have exactly the same loop here going on and it, it trains and gradually gets, gets better. You can see the species here that it found. There are three of them. When we do the prediction, you'll see that it's an array of three elements each. So this is just the probability of each of those three iris flowers. You can suppress the scientific notation also if you like. We also have to convert it to CPU and detach it from TensorFlow so that we can use it as a numpy array. So here we're, we, we also can then turn it into 0, 1, 2. We can force these to become class numbers. So you can see the predictions were zeros, ones, or twos. The flowers are in order, so the fact that all the zeros, then the ones, and then the twos, means it did really pretty well. We can also convert this into the actual text names. So we're just using the species array in this case. We can print out the accuracy. It's nearly 100% accurate. You can also throw in ad hoc flowers. So here I just made up four values, and I'm predicting what those what, what type of flower that might be. That's an iris versa color. And then finally, you can, you can do more than one at once, which is very efficient. Thanks for watching this video, and please like and subscribe and click the bell icon so that you don't miss anything in this course. And thank you to all the Patreon and YouTube members for your support. It's very much appreciated.